Hi there, this is going to be just a short little tutorial about doing something that we call a free return trajectory. Now before we get started I should probably explain what a free return trajectory is. If we go and look at the map mode here and see our position relative to the moon, I'll put the moon over here on the right, a free return trajectory is basically a trajectory that will put us on a path towards the moon and circle around it in a clockwise or retrograde direction around the moon and then return us back home without doing any additional burns. Uh, this is important in the space program because this is a safer way to travel to the moon. Uh, during the Apollo program, for instance, they uh, used free return trajectories to uh, enable them to have a safe return back to Earth if something went wrong. And in the case of Apollo 13, this may very well have saved their lives. Um, because in that case what happened was there was an explosion on the spacecraft and they could no longer use the main engine. Uh, the service module was rendered inoperable and they were able to do a course correction on the return trip uh, using the engine on the lunar module. However, the, uh, uh, the free return trajectory allows you to return home without doing any additional major burns around the location of the moon. Because otherwise if you went and put yourself on a trajectory to go in a normal counterclockwise or prograde orbit around the moon, it would require a burn to capture into that orbit and it would require another large burn to escape from that orbit. And you're going to execute similar burns anyway if you're planning to do any sort of lunar uh, landing. However, if you're doing so in a prograde direction, if your engine was not functioning, you would just be uh, redirected out into space. And so the free return trajectory allows us to get home uh, even if our engines are having problems. So while in Kerbal Space Program we have a lot of other ways of dealing with uh, uh, mistakes that we make, such as running out of fuel, um, we can load from a quick save, for instance. Um, in the real world, we don't have that luxury. So. Uh, in the game, this becomes just an interesting exercise, uh, something that you can try to do if you are, uh, say, you know, you're new to the game and you haven't learned how to land on the moon yet, but you'd like to do a flyby. Uh, this is an interesting, historically, uh, historically significant way of uh, doing a flyby on the moon. So first we're going to start with uh, trying to set up our maneuver. And I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. I'm also going to get the nav ball ready. And the important thing to remember, of course, as with all orbital maneuvers, uh, the direction, the side of the orbit that we want to alter, which in this case is going to be over here, uh, we have to burn from the opposite side of our orbit. And we're going to try to burn prograde, prograde uh, or into the uh, direction of our vector of travel as much as possible uh, rather than in any other direction because that is simply the most fuel efficient way to alter your trajectory. Now a good rule of thumb when going to the moon or the mun, uh, however you choose to pronounce it, um, I'm just going to say moon because it's a generic term and in this case it, it is a moon that we are going to, it just happens to be the one that we're uh, referring to specifically. Uh, a good rule of thumb for going to this particular moon is that uh, by the time you travel to it, it's probably going to travel about 90 degrees through its orbit. So an easy way for us to get to it is to start our burn probably about over here. And I'll start by just simply at pulling on the prograde ve vector here. We're going to add velocity. And as you can see, it's very easy to get an, uh, get an encounter with the moon. Now the important thing here is that we want to make sure we have enough velocity to get into uh, get into a good encounter, but we're also going to have to change our starting time a little bit. And you're going to see that this uh, flickers and changes. It's going to go through a lot of different permutations here, but we want to try to find a position, and we're probably going to have to thrust aggressively. We want to try to find a position where it's going to put us into uh, a tight loop around the moon and the one that actually gives us a periapsis. Now as you can see here we have a periapsis and it's a very low one, it's at uh, 37 and a half kilometers but nevertheless if we have a periapsis at all that means we are not on a collision course. And if I z just come a little bit closer to it here one of the things you can also see is that our trajectory forms this nice little figure eight pattern right around the moon and then it comes back out. The current trajectory that we're on is the, is the blue one, of course. The yellow trajectory is the one that we're creating with our maneuver. 
the purple trajectory is the one that's uh, going to occur while we're within the moon's sphere of influence. And the sphere of influence is simply the region of space in which its gravitational pull uh, exceeds that of, gra of the, the pull of the, uh, the planet outside. Now in the case of a Kerbal Space Program, it doesn't simulate the gravity from multiple bodies simultaneously. So in this case, within that sphere of influence, we're only being influenced by the moon. Now the green trajectory is the orbit that we'll, we will be placed on upon exiting uh, the moon's sphere of influence. Now as you can see, this gets us back to the planet. This, this right here qualifies as a free, free return trajectory. However, it puts us into a fairly high Kerbin periapsis, uh, one in which we would absolutely have to do uh, an additional burn with our engines if we wanted to have a landing back on Kerbin. So this would work. Uh, we would just require uh, that additional burn later. However, if we tweak it a little bit, we can probably change the target, uh, you know, the, the resulting uh, orbit here a little bit more further. And as you can see, the, the game gets a little bit uh, tricky in terms of how um, these orbits will get uh, predicted for you. They're not always uh, uh, going to show purely, completely accurate results. As you can see here, I've gotten the periapsis down a little bit further. Let's see if we can tweak that just a little bit better. I'm going to add a little bit more velocity and see if I can get that prograde, or I'm sorry, that periapsis to come down further. And it's looking like we're succeeding at that. The periapsis is now at 63 kilometers. Now it's at 4 kilometers. That's a guaranteed landing. That's going to bring us well within the atmosphere. And, of course, of importance here, we need to also make sure that we're still not going to crash into the moon. In actuality here, our periapsis has gone up as a result of increasing the, uh, the burn velocity that we're going to use to escape from Kerbin. So now that we have this all set up, we can actually go ahead and execute this maneuver. And if everything goes as, as planned, you'll see that we'll come back into the atmosphere and won't have to do any additional course corrections. That's an ideal circumstance. I will say up front here, however, that when you're executing these kinds of maneuvers, or any maneuvers in general, uh, that involve crossing in and out of spheres of influence, there is a chance that the periapsis or apoapsis that you're, uh, that you're targeting may not get the exact results that you planned on. This is, uh, this, there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, one, is, one important reason is the fact that uh, the floating point errors uh, in how the game calculates the orbits uh, can accumulate and get compounded uh, when you're crossing sphere of influence transitions. Um, if you're doing this at a very high time warp, uh, uh, speed, if you're accelerating time quite a bit, uh, it, it makes a very large jump across that transition uh, that will t generally create a larger error in terms of uh, uh, deviating from the predicted flight path. Um, so it's often a good idea to cross these transitions at a low time warp setting if you want to make sure that your maneuver is accurate. Now secondly, we this is something that will happen with maneuver nodes uh, under all circumstances, is that the maneuver takes, it take, makes the assumption that you're going to execute that burn with a, z a zero duration. If you could instantly add that much velocity in the, the direction that you've chosen, then the prediction would be very accurate. But part of the problem is, is that it takes time for you to execute the burn. And during that time, the planet has opportunity to alter your trajectory uh, during the, the course of that burn. And so it will make, it, make the results less accurate. And you'll find that the longer the burn, the less accurate your maneuver will execute. So now in this case, my test vehicle is a uh, very small spacecraft and it's using a skipper engine, which is often only used in uh, uh, booster sections uh, for uh, you know lifting off from Kerbin. Not a lot of people use them in space, although you certainly can. Um, but for such a small spacecraft, this has a lot of acceleration, and so we're going to execute these burns fairly rapidly. So now we're going to look at the nav ball here, and the first thing we want to do, of course, after we have our maneuver created, is that we want to move our, uh, point our ship along the prograde vector of the maneuver. We're not going to look at the current orbital prograde or retrograde vectors because those are uh, relative to our current position, but the maneuver marker will always line up relative to the actual maneuver itself. 
So we can line up in advance and this will save us time and we don't have to worry about uh, spinning around and looking for this marker when we have only seconds left uh, in our schedule towards our maneuver. So now this maneuver is going to be a fairly hefty burn. It's uh, 854 meters per second. Uh, it's not currently displaying how many seconds we're estimating that to be. One thing we can do is just tap the engine really quick and that gives us uh, a calculated time here. It says 53 seconds. I'm, not, I'm still not sure if I believe that exactly, but we'll start our burn a little early just to uh, account for that anyway. So now what we will do is we'll time warp towards our maneuver. And because of our altitude, we can't go any faster than 50 times, so I apologize for that. However, this is also a fairly rapid orbit, so it won't take us too long to come around. Six minutes, five minutes, four minutes. I'm going to slow down here. We're at under a minute to go. And when we get to about 20 seconds shy of it, I'm going to start my burn. So right about there is probably good. Now you can see that my, I've drifted off my marker a little bit. That's okay. We can adjust for that fairly quickly. And we'll start our burn, and we are underway. If I come back to the view here, oh boy, slow with the texture loads. As you can see, it's a fairly lightweight spacecraft with a large engine, as I was pointing out earlier. As we get close to the end of our burn here, I'll slow down and back off on the throttle. And then I will fine tune it a little bit further. And if you look closely here, the periapsis that we're getting from this, that we want, still want that to end up inside the atmosphere. In fact, I've put that on a collision course. I'm going to cancel the maneuver at this point because we now have what we want. This will still put us into the atmosphere. However, if I'm not comfortable with coming in quite so aggressively and would like to back off on that a little bit, what I can do is use the RCS. I will turn that on here and I can press the N key to reverse thrust a little bit and that will re-widen our orbit. Now we're back up to a, you know, in this case, I'll set it for about 13 kilometers. That looks pretty good to me. That is still very much a guaranteed capture as long as we don't lose uh, any accuracy in our orbital, uh, orbital projection here uh, when we cross the sphere of influence boundaries. So now that we've done this, I'm going to turn RCS back off and I'll start time warping towards the moon. If we have executed all of this correctly, then we won't need to do any additional course corrections for the rest of the journey. And if you can imagine that if you were heading to the moon in a small spacecraft uh, yourself, uh, and th there was a chance that something might go wrong with your spacecraft, and you might not be able to use the engine correctly, that this would actually be a very comforting, uh, it would be very comforting to know that you're on a trajectory that will bring you back home if you do nothing else. So now that we've gotten a little further away from the planet, I can speed this up. And as we get close to the sphere of influence boundary, once again, I'm going to slow down. Three minutes, two minutes, one minute. Oh, I'm sorry, that's a pop-up from one of the uh, uh, mods that I'm using. The alarm clock is automatically setting uh, alarms for sphere of influence boundaries for me. So here I'll speed up a little bit again to time accelerate into our sphere of influence. So now as you can see, as I was pointing out earlier, we're going to go in a clockwise or otherwise retrograde orbit around the moon. Normally you don't want to go in retrograde orbits when you're encountering a, a planetary body. Uh, what will end up happening is that it requires a lot more fuel in order to uh, synchronize your speed with it and get into a circularized orbit. Um, in this case the velocities are not terribly huge so the, uh, the additional fuel, fuel requirements are not enormous. Uh, however, it's still generally undesirable under most circumstances but the point of this exercise is to do the free return, which requires us to go in this direction. So now we're going to do our little flyby of the moon. I'm going to time accelerate. I'm going to slow that down back to 100 times here. 
and I will zoom back into our spacecraft and as you can see we're passing on the night side of the moon. It's actually probably difficult for you to see at the moment but there we are we're flying away from the moon again. And we're flying away at a pretty good clip because I'm still using a hundred uh, hundred times time acceleration. And I'm going to speed this up a little bit again as we pass away from the moon. And we will reach our escape from the moon here. And once again the mod pops up. I will close that. While we're still escaping we get an inaccurate projection of what our orbit is going to look like. Unfortunately that's a little bit of a bug in version point 23.5. Hopefully they'll correct that in the future. But as you can see we have now escaped from the moon. We're now back in an orbit around Kerbin. And our periapsis is now at 9 kilometers. So it, it's changed a little bit from where I had originally set it. If you'll remember I'd set it for about 12 to 13 kilometers uh, just before I had left Kerbin and uh, now it's down to nine kilometers so we did lose a little bit of accuracy but it's just fine this has put us well within the atmosphere and we will have no problem doing our re-entry and as you can see all we did was that one engine burn to escape from Kerbin we did a flyby of the moon and we come back completely for free no additional energy required and that is why it is called a free return trajectory if I zoom back into my spacecraft now as you can see we are approaching the planet. I'm going to time accelerate a little bit further. Ah, this is the direction that we're traveling here. As we get closer I'm going to come back out of time warp for a moment. And there we have it. We've successfully returned back to Kerbin and from here you can just proceed with a normal landing. I hope this tutorial was useful to you and I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.